So good day from Vienna. Today is uh, Monday, the 18th of uh, January. This is a briefing organized by Atomic Reporters, which is a Canadian registered non-governmental organization operating in Vienna, Austria, as a non-governmental international organization registered with the Austrian Foreign Ministry. Uh, its mandate is to provide assistance to journalists to cover nuclear governance issues, nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, safety, security, peaceful uses. I am Tarek Rauf, uh, one of the members of the Board of Directors of Atomic Reporters and formerly Head of Verification and Security Policy at the International Atomic Energy Agency. This week, there will be an important development of global importance for humankind and for the benefit of uh, the peoples of the world. It's probably not what you are thinking that I'm referring to. What I'm referring to is the entry into force on Friday, the 22nd of January, of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It's also called the Nuclear Ban Treaty. It was negotiated in 2017, and with the deposit of the 50th state to ratify it on the 24th of October last year, it triggered the 90-day entry into force uh, procedure of the treaty, so this treaty will enter into force this uh, coming uh, Friday. Today, it is estimated that there are nearly 13,500 nuclear weapons possessed by nine countries, deployed at more than 100 locations in 14 countries. In addition, we have nearly 1,900,000 kilograms of weapon usable material, and it only takes 25 kilograms or less of highly enriched uranium or eight kilograms or less of plutonium to make one nuclear weapon. It's given this threat and also the fact that there are nearly 2,000 nuclear weapons that are on ready to launch a status in the United States and the Russian Federation that led a number of countries to raise the issue about the humanitarian consequences of the detonation of any nuclear weapon for both the environment and for uh, the well-being and safety of the people of the world that led them to uh, this conference in 2017 to negotiate a treaty, which, as I mentioned, was adopted by 122 states. So with this treaty entering into force, the international community has banned all three categories of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, biological and toxin weapons were banned in 1972. Chemical weapons were banned in 1993. And now with this treaty entering into force, we are also banning um, nuclear weapons. So to discuss this treaty and the importance of the occasion of this treaty entering into force, we have two distinguished panelists. We have Ambassador Alexander Kement, he is the head of the Nuclear Disarmament and Arms Control Office at the Austrian Foreign Ministry. He has played a key role in highlighting the unacceptable risks of catastrophic humanitarian and environmental consequences of nuclear weapons. In December 2014, he organized in Vienna the third international conference on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. At the Vienna conference, more than 150 countries issued a declaration calling for nuclear disarmament. Alexander also played a key role at the 2015 NPT Review Conference, where he chaired the subsidiary body that negotiated elements of nuclear disarmament. Unfortunately, the 2015 uh, Review Conference was not able to agree on a final declaration. Uh, Alexander also played a key role in the negotiation of the Nuclear Ban Treaty, and he has recently completed a book, uh, which would be published shortly on his experience uh, in both organizing the conference in Vienna as well as negotiating the nuclear ban treaty. I should also mention that uh, the Arms Control Association uh, in 2014 awarded him the distinction of being the Arms Control Person of the Year. And that year, he actually got more votes than His Holiness Pope Francis, who, as you know, has called the possession and use of nuclear weapons uh, immoral. Our other speaker joining us from Washington is Daryl Kimball, who is the executive director of the Arms Control Association since 2001. Daryl is one of the leading influential experts in Washington on nuclear arms control, listened to by the White House and Congress. The Arms Control Association, though having only a handful of staff and limited funding, regularly outshines 
bigger and better funded think tanks in Washington. It regularly produces well-researched policy papers and briefs on all aspects of arms control. And it also publishes a renowned journal called Arms Control Today. The Arms Control Association provides its analyses for free on its website and is a nonpartisan membership organization with a very reasonable annual dues. And I would highly recommend our online participants to consider joining uh, the Arms Control Association as a member. Uh, the Arms Control Association tomorrow at 11 o'clock uh, Washington time, that's Eastern Standard Time, uh, will be uh, doing their own Zoom uh, briefing on um, uh, nuclear arms control, this treaty, and what is expected of uh, the new incoming Biden administration. So let's start our discussion uh, with the importance and uh, significance of this treaty. So starting with Alexander Kement, uh, could you tell us briefly, what does the ban treaty mean to you personally? Uh, what it means for Austria and what do you think it should mean for the rest of the world? Sorry, I forgot to un unmute myself. Thank you, Tarek, uh, uh, for the kind introduction and uh, um, welcome to uh, all participants. Uh, what the ban treaty means for me personally, it's uh, it's uh, it's a matter of pride. I can say this quite uh, quite uh, openly. I'm, I'm immensely proud, having been uh, closely involved uh, in that process, uh, and and uh, and having been able to play a role in my function uh, uh, when I had the same job that I've now restarted in the foreign ministry. I had that position from 2011 to 2016. So I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm extremely uh, pleased uh, about that. What it means for Austria, it's uh, um, Austria has a very strong all-partisan traditional uh, position um, in favor of nuclear disarmament and rejection of nuclear energy in all its forms, uh, be it for uh, um, uh, uh, civilian purposes and uh, for military use. Uh, there is even a constitutional law in Austria from 1998, uh, which uh, prohibits uh, 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 use for um, of nuclear energy uh, in Austria, and which also has provisions on nuclear weapons, which are actually quite similar to some, some of the uh, TPNW provisions. What it means internationally, uh, it's historic, I would say. Uh, it's uh, more than 70 years after uh, these weapons were first used in Japan, and uh, also more than 70 years, uh, 1946, when the very first resolution of the UN General Assembly called for the uh, abolition and prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, it wasn't possible until now. It was very, it's a very contested space. It's a very contested topic. There was very strong and continues to be very strong resistance to a prohibition because there are uh, uh, most powerful states are still of the view that uh, these weapons uh, enhance security and enhance uh, status. So there was strong opposition to it, but uh, um, Nevertheless, it was possible uh, through a coalition of, uh, of, uh, of states and with the help of civil society to achieve this uh, prohibition, which is an aspiration of the international community for decades. And of course, it's only the beginning. It's only, it's, uh, it only sets the, it only provides the legal basis to make further progress on nuclear disarmament but uh, it's an absolutely essential uh, step uh, for that process. So uh, on all three aspects, personal for Austria and international, uh, uh, I think it's a very positive assessment. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Alexander. Coming to you, Daryl, I'll put the same question to you. What does the nuclear ban treaty mean to you as an arms control expert? What would it mean to your country, the United States, which invented nuclear weapons and is the only one to have used them thus far, fortunately? And what does it mean to civil society in the rest of the world? Well, the, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, I think, uh, for people like me who've been working for the elimination of nuclear weapons, uh, the reduction of nuclear risk for many years, uh, this is clearly a turning point in uh, what has been a long struggle against uh, the bomb. Um, 
there are uh, a few key historical turning points in the history of nuclear weapons uh, that have made a huge difference in uh, the conversation and I think the uh, the debate um, and the trajectory of of uh, of history. Uh, the limited test ban treaty of 1963, the 1968 nuclear nonproliferation treaty, the 1996 conference of nuclear test ban treaty, all uh, were key events in the history of nuclear weapons that have have reduced the nuclear danger and. Like those, uh, the, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is a turning point, and I think it, it has and will continue to, to change the nature of the conversation about nuclear weapons. Um, it's going to and, and has already kind of returned, uh, I think, the public and policymakers to uh, a reality that's been around for a long time but has been forgotten about, which is what the devastating effect of nuclear weapons are, that they are... Um, immoral, and with this treaty, they're now uh, illegal. Um, and this treaty has reinforced the legal norm against nuclear weapons possession and use, even if uh, you're a state that is not party to uh, the treaty. And, and I must also just note today, I've been thinking about this conversation, Tarek, uh, today here in the United States, we're observing Martin Luther King Day. And um, the realization that nuclear weapons um, need to be banned um, goes back. And in 1957, December 1957, Dr. King said, I definitely feel the development and use of nuclear weapons should be banned. It cannot be disputed that a full-scale nuclear war would be utterly catastrophic. Hundreds of millions of people would be killed outright by the blast heat uh, and by the ionizing radiation produced at the instant of the explosion. Even countries not directly uh, hit by the bombs would suffer. So uh, on this Martin Luther King Day, uh, just a couple of days before the entry into force of the treaty, I mean, I, I would say it's, it's um, an important and, and, and optimistic uh, turning point in, in the history uh, against, uh, in the struggle against nuclear weapons. Thank you, Daryl, and also thank you for reminding us about what Dr. Martin Luther King said nearly half a century back on the destructive nature of these weapons. Alexander, we, we know that the treaty bans nuclear weapons, but could you describe how this treaty bans nuclear weapons, uh, in what way does it ban them, and which countries would be bound by this treaty? Well, it is a, a comprehensive prohibition, uh, all aspects from the possession uh, to the threat uh, to the uh, development to testing. Uh, so it, 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 it encompasses uh, um, all aspects about nuclear weapons. And it also bans, and I think that is important, it bans uh, the practice of nuclear deterrence. Um, so the TPNW is is based, and maybe there's a difference to the NPT. Uh, the, the NPT, of course, uh, um, distinguishes between who has weapons and uh, who, who doesn't, whereas the rationale of the TPNW uh, looks at the characteristics of the weapon itself and comes to the conclusion, as Daryl said, that because of the devastating humanitarian consequences and risks, the weapon itself, irrespective uh, of who should have them, uh, should be banned. It's basically what uh, former UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon said in 2013 when he said, uh, there are no right hands to handle these wrong weapons. Now, uh, legally, the TPNW bans uh, the parties that uh, sign up to the treaty. And uh, at the moment, of course, these are exclusively non-nuclear weapon states, which in a way double up on their already existing legal obligations with respect to nuclear weapons. But of course, uh, um, the, 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 the strength of the treaty is uh, can be measured in terms of uh, uh, legal uh, impact, but uh, uh, the normative aspect of a treaty uh, and the discursive aspect of a treaty goes beyond strictly uh, the legal dimension. And that is the logic behind it. You cannot uh, force countries to give up these weapons, but you can make um, 
make the arguments for it, and you can bring this discussion uh, uh, to those who, for the time being, uh, are skeptical about the treaty. And uh, so when, I mean, Article 12 obliges uh, states parties of the treaty to uh, promote the universaliz universalization of the treaty. I would say this comprises of two aspects. It's one, to bring more countries to sign and ratify the treaty, to increase the number of countries that are legally bound to it. But the second dimension of universalization is a more broad one, is a discursive one, is to, is to promote the uh, rationale and the underlying arguments of the treaty, and to challenge the assumptions uh, uh, on which uh, states that currently uh, still rely on nuclear weapons based and nuclear deterrence policies. Uh, and I think uh, the, the arguments of the TPNW are quite compelling that once you look in concrete terms uh, at uh, the uh, the humanitarian consequences uh, and environmental consequences and the interrelationship of the consequences. And once you look at the risks and the risk drivers and uh, the increasing risks uh, uh, given uh, as a result of the number of countries that have these weapons, as a result of the of the uh, multitude of deterrence relationships among those countries, all of which uh, are prone to fail, um, at uh, the new element of risks in, introduced uh, by new technologies, uh, the simple dimension of human and technical errors. If you add all these aspects together with the humanitarian consequences, the veracity of assumptions uh, uh, that underpin nuclear deterrence starts to look very shaky. And the discussion that needs to be had is, so at what stage, what, what are the parameters when countries that currently believe uh, that they need nuclear weapons, at what stage, at what level of consequences, at what level of risks uh, would the uh, calculus start to change for them? So that is, a, that is another dimension of uh, promoting uh, and projecting the uh, normative and moral dimension of the treaty beyond the strict uh, legal sense. Thank you. Okay, that was a very good comprehensive answer. Daryl, building on what you said in response to the first question and what uh, Alexander just said, um, by banning nuclear weapons, how does this reduce the threat from nuclear weapons and how does this reduce nuclear dangers of accidental war or war by um, uh, an, an unplanned war, so to speak? Well, I think... While it's true that the, the TPNW uh, reinforces the legal norms against uh, the possession, development, production, use, testing of nuclear weapons, um, it doesn't immediately uh, reduce the risk of the, uh, the possession by the existing nine nuclear weapon states today. Um, this is where I think we, have, we all have some work to do. Uh, the, the TPNW is not a, an all-in-one solution for today's problems. It frames the endpoint for where um, all states need to, to go to, to meet their, uh, their obligations, legal and political and moral, to uh, support the elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, I think it does reinforce the obligations that have been have been undertaken by non-nuclear weapon states under the non-proliferation treaty and expands them um, but i think where i think it might have the most powerful effect in the near term is that it uh, delegitimizes um, the possession and the use and by use i also mean the exercise of the the, the concept of nuclear deterrence um, as a, a foreign and military strategy. I mean, this is what Alex was was referring to. Um, I think it will give greater pause to those world leaders who um, have nuclear weapons um, about uh, how they talk about them, about how they uh, use them. Um, of course, you have to have rational leaders who understand some of these issues, but... Um, I think that's what the effect uh, may be. And, and you know, one thing, one way to think about this, um, one way that we've been describing this is, you know, just as the 
international community understands that we cannot continue uh, with an, uh, a carbon-based uh, energy future. We cannot continue to extract oil and gas and coal from the ground and survive. Uh, we need to recognize that we cannot continue to live in a world in which you've got uh, several countries threatening uh, the potential use of nuclear weapons at a, on a massive scale or even on a smaller scale. It's just not a sustainable future, and we need to find a, uh, start working towards an alternative. And so I think the TPNW, when I say it's a turning point, um, it, it, I think, is a, a lever by which governments like Austria, like Ireland, like New Zealand, like South Africa, who've been leading the charge for the TPNW, uh, can engage in the conversation with uh, the governments of and the representatives of the governments of the nuclear armed states about ways forward towards zero on an accelerated basis. I think it can also um, help those campaigners in nuclear armed states raise questions about the legality and the morality of participating in a nuclear deterrence based uh, economy or investments, et cetera. Um, so in that sense, I think it's a conversation starter. It is a, a, a way in which we can uh, uh, question the, the current status quo, uh, which I don't think is sustainable. I don't think many thoughtful people believe is, is sustainable for another 75 years. Thanks, Daryl. So staying with you, uh, the United States took the lead in opposing the nuclear ban treaty. As you know, in 2016, they sent a letter to countries not to join the negotiations. And last October, the U.S. circulated a letter telling the countries that had signed to unsign the treaty. So what were the reasons behind the U.S.'s opposition? And do you foresee any change in the U.S. position once the new administration takes office? Well, the, as you mentioned, the Trump administration uh, was very aggressive and active in its opposition of the TPNW uh, last year, uh, going so far as to uh, write to governments urging them to unsign or at least not to sign and ratify. Um, that position and the critique uh, picked up from uh, some of the critiques that were developed uh, during the late Obama administration in response to the treaty. I think th there are two basic uh, criticisms that were were leveled. Um, one is that the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons creates an alternative legal framework that will compete with the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty uh, and therefore uh, may undermine the NPT. Uh, a second critique was that the TPNW uh, was insufficient with respect to, um, you know, uh, building up the safeguards regime, um, uh, requiring states to um, take the uh, adopt the, the highest level of um, uh, safeguards and monitoring to ensure that they're not they're not pursuing nuclear weapons. Um, I think in both these areas, I mean, the critique uh, is uh, misplaced and incorrect. Uh, you know, Alice can tell us better than anybody that the, uh, the the framers of the TPNW and the text of the treaty itself, the negotiations show that the countries that support the TPNW that negotiate the TPNW strongly support the NPT. Uh, the treaty is compatible, and I think it reinforces the NPT as well as the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, as for the criticisms that uh, the TPNW does not um, require states' parties to take on uh, the highest level of IAEA safeguards, um, which today is the additional protocol, um, I would just say that uh, NPT states' parties have not required NPT states' parties to take on the additional protocol as an obligation. It is encouraged, um, but it is not a requirement. And so in a similar way, the TPNW encourages uh, the highest form of, of safeguards. The TPNW also doesn't spell out exactly how uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons uh, by nuclear armed countries who may join the treaty uh, would be affected. And I think, you know, 
that's a question that has not been answered by the experts, by governments. Um, it would have been, I think, it w w was uh, it's unreasonable to expect that the states parties who negotiated the TPNW could have figured this out, especially without the nuclear armed state. So I think the criticisms are uh, either incorrect or misplaced. Um, I think most of the resistance from the United States really has to do with the fact that the TPNW challenges the very basis of the United States current uh, nuclear strategy, which is to uh, maintain nuclear weapons, to use them for deterrence, um, so long as other countries uh, possess these these weapons. And so the TPNW is seen as a, in that sense, a threat to the United States um, current strategy. Now, um, as many people in the U.S. and outside the U.S. should realize, um, the there are differences of opinions in the United States and in and and, and policies uh, uh, between presidential administrations. There's continuity, but there are also differences. And I believe that the new Biden administration is going to take another look at the TPNW. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, it will take what I would call a more conciliatory and neutral approach to the TPNW. Um, and I think, you know, we've been recommending over the past several weeks with the transition team uh, and in including people who are, who have now been nominated to take key positions that the Biden administration should acknowledge that the TPNW exists. Uh, it should welcome uh, the effort by the governments that have negotiated this treaty, that have signed the treaty, that have ratified the treaty as a good faith effort to fulfill their obligation to pursue um, Article 6, NPT Article 6 obligations, and uh, that the Biden administration in the United States will work with those countries that are party to the TPNW uh, towards our, the common goal of a world without nuclear weapons. So I think that more conciliatory approach uh, would help build bridges rather than to uh, perpetuate the divide over this uh, these issues. Um, I think it would help uh, build momentum for a meaningful uh, action plan at the 2021 NPT Review Conference um, and, uh, and help us move forward rather than continue to, to, you know, to, to argue about, uh, to, to make arguments that I think uh, had been made by the U.S. government that are incorrect. Thank you. I think that's good advice. And there is now sort of um, uh, growing momentum that uh, states with nuclear weapons and their allies should find ways of um, communicating with the supporters of the TPNW to find common ground for the next NPT review conference. Uh, coming back to you, Alexander, uh, the nuclear weapon states, in particular France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, referred to the principles of undiminished security for all and the indivisibility of security. These are terms found in non-proliferation treaty review conference documents. And they assert that the nuclear ban treaty does not address their security concerns and in fact will have a negative effect on their security. So what do you make of these assertions? Thank you. First of all, I want to say that I thought uh, Daryl's answer to the previous question was uh, was spot on, and I I, I, I subscribe to everything he said. Um, security environment. First of all, um, undiminished security for all. What does this actually mean? So, whose security is supposed to be undiminished? Is it uh, is when we talk about nuclear weapons? Are we talking about uh, the security of individual states, or are nuclear weapons a global issue? And we're talking about global security being undiminished. Uh, if you believe in the NPT, as we do, uh, the NPT is a bargain, and uh, and uh, um, so the undiminished security for all uh, surely should be based on that bargain, uh, be the undiminished security of all. States parties. So um, I would say um, that uh, some of the criticisms uh, brought against the TPNW um, are, in a way, a deflection from the kind of discussion that Daryl was mentioning and what non nuclear weapon states actually want to 
have for decades, and that simply hasn't really been possible in the multilateral frameworks that uh, that we have, uh, where uh, traditionally decisions are to be taken by consensus. So a a illusion of a consensus uh, is achieved with ambiguous language. Um, the way I understand when nuclear weapon states refer to undiminished security for all, it's they refer to it as their undiminished security and as a an argument to maintain nuclear deterrence parity. So that it's the it's the qualification that steps towards nuclear disarmament are only to be taken uh, simultaneously among states. So as long as one of the nuclear weapon states doesn't take a step, the principle of undiminished security for all the way I understand nuclear weapon states understand it means that no steps are to be taken. Well, that's certainly not the way non-nuclear weapon states uh, interpret the principle of undiminished security for all. And whose security are we talking about? If you uh, you are aware of the of the studies as a spin-off of the climate change uh, debate, the, the simulation, uh, the calculations of uh, um, nuclear wind uh, as a result already of a so-called limited nuclear war, if uh, the calculation was on the basis of uh, uh, a simulation of a war between India and Pakistan. Let's use this as an example. If India and Pakistan apply the principle of undiminished security for all to each other in a nuclear deterrence relationship, and that fails, and that failed uh, relationship leads to a famine in Africa, or in Latin America, or in other parts of the world, which, according to scientific data, would be a possible, if not likely, result, then the question of undiminished security for all looks uh, uh, the issue of undiminished security for all looks differently. And that is precisely the discussion. First of all, it's precisely the rationale that underpins the TPNW, and it's precisely the discussion about security and nuclear weapons that non-nuclear weapon states have been demanding for a long time. And uh, finally, with the TPNW and also through the process, how it was achieved against uh, very determined opposition, this perception, this interpretation of undiminished security for all has found its way into an international legally binding treaty. And that is, I'm optimistic, the way um, the vast majority of non-nuclear weapon states interpret and have always interpreted uh, the principle of undiminished security for all. Thank you. Thank you. So these both these terms crept into international discourse during the special sessions on disarmament at the UN, and then from there they found their way into the final documents of the NPT. And the way some of the nuclear weapon states understand this is that reducing or giving up their nuclear weapons in ways that they are not fully uh, ascribed to diminishes their security, and therefore they cannot do anything. So now I'm going to quote something back to you that you've recently written, which sort of illustrates what you just uh, described. And I would like you to um, elaborate a little bit more on that. And then I will have one more question for Daryl, and then we will open it up for a discussion with the online participants. So in a recent article, you stated that, and I quote, the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons explosions are too grave, unacceptable, and potentially global and the risks of nuclear weapons and the practice of nuclear deterrence postures are too high. You also said that nuclear dependent states find it more difficult to argue their professed support for nuclear disarmament, while at the same time criticizing the nuclear ban treaty and defending the necessity of nuclear weapons and the nuclear status quo. So what do you mean by this? Could you just elaborate it a little bit more for a more general audience? Well, thank you. On the on the on the first quote, on the humanitarian consequences being too too grave and the risks too high, that links back, of course, to the question of undiminished security for all. I am personally convinced that once you start looking at the at nuclear weapons, not only through a nuclear deterrence prison, the what nuclear deterrence is, is a psychological 
projection of behavior. Once you do not do that, but once you start looking at what these weapons actually do, how terrible it is what they do, and how risky the practice of nuclear deterrence and the possession of nuclear deterrence is, once you start looking at it through that lens, then the calculation of nuclear deterrence start to change. That's a very important and complicated discussion that uh, nuclear armed states, unfortunately, have so far not engaged with, with non-nuclear weapon states. Because at the end of the day, they don't really want to discuss nuclear weapons postures with uh, non-nuclear weapon states, because for them, it's a national security issue. That is, again, the clash of what do we mean by undiminished security for all. I believe it's high time, just as climate change and other global issues are now understood to only be solvable at the global level and in a more inclusive and in a more democratic way, even though there's a lot of pushback. I'm optimistic that the nuclear weapons uh, issue will eventually also end up uh, in that space, that it's a, understood as a truly global issue. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, the way the TPNW process uh, happened is that nuclear weapon states essentially boycotted uh, this process from the get-go. Uh, whereas nuclear dependent states, meaning states under a nuclear umbrella, um, under pressure from civil society and under pressure from their traditional way of positioning self in the nuclear weapons debate as being in supportive of nuclear disarmament, found it politically necessary to participate in these discussions and came into, into a sort of argumentative conflict. On the one hand, uh, in the case of NATO countries, the US wasn't there. The US, who would have probably criticized the TPNW, wasn't there. So it was left to the nuclear dependent states to essentially make the arguments for the US and other nuclear weapon states. And that came into conflict. Uh, uh, so on the one hand, there is a self-image that these countries have as promoters of multilateralism, as promoters of nuclear disarmament, uh, and found themselves in a situation of being confronted with strong momentum on the part of the vast majority of non-nuclear weapon states going for a prohibition based on a cogent rationale of humanitarian consequences and risks. And they found themselves in the situation of having to defend nuclear weapons, having to defend the practice of nuclear deterrence, and they found it very difficult to uh, to reconcile this contradiction. So I think the TPNW has probably um, provided some clarity to the issue of uh, uh, to the nuclear weapons debate and poses the question much more clearly than has been the case before. Are you actually in favor of nuclear disarmament because of the urgency, uh, or are you not? And, uh, and, and uh, of course, there are shades of gray there. I, I, I know that. But the situation has become more complicated uh, and is likely to become even more complicated as the TPNW enters into force, gathers strength, and as the arguments uh, on which the TPNW is based are uh, promulgated even further and discussed in a more democratic and more inclusive uh, way in uh, in in societies. Thank you. Quite a complicated issue. So, uh, Daryl, uh, continuing on this theme, Alexander in the same article said, "Quote: In 2010, in its strategic concept, NATO stated that as long as nuclear weapons exist." NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. This is an oft-cited quote to underscore NATO's opposition to the nuclear ban treaty. The logical corollary to the statement is, of course, that nuclear weapons will exist as long as NATO remains a nuclear alliance, unquote. So as the U.S. is the leader of NATO and its nuclear weapons underpin the security of uh, NATO countries, what are your views on NATO's strategic concept and NATO's criticisms of the ban treaty and finally, NATO has also said that uh, ban treaty proponents are naive because their arguments will only sort of, uh, they will sort of lobby in the democratic states, whereas the autocratic states will be immune to these arguments. So I was wondering if you could say something on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Well, uh, you know, that, that oft-repeated line about uh, NATO being a nuclear alliance, um, you know, I think it needs to be rethought. Um, I think most NATO states, uh, their security does not uh, rely upon the threat of the use of nuclear weapons. Um, the use of nuclear weapons in a conflict that NATO might be involved in uh, would very likely lead to the destruction of NATO uh, countries. So I, I think NATO is overdue to examine the strategic concept and the role that nuclear weapons play, particularly the 160 or so nuclear gravity bombs that are uh, US nuclear gravity bombs that are stored in, in five countries. Um, I believe it is possible and uh, likely that someday uh, in the years ahead that one or more non-nuclear weapon hosting NATO states uh, will become parties to the, the ban treaty. Uh, their relationship to the ban treaty would be complicated as uh, long as they're members of NATO, but I think it is, it is possible that they, they could and should uh, join. Um, the other thing I would just note um, is that, uh, you know, the NATO position on the ban treaty, uh, especially since 2017 when the, the, the treaty was concluded, really has been shaped by um, the, uh, you know, the NATO countries' uh, uneasy relationship with the Trump administration, the concern that uh, Trump might abandon NATO, uh, the concern that uh, you know any distance that they uh, create between uh, you know the Netherlands and the United States, or Belgium and the United States, or Italy and the United States, Germany and the United States, uh, would be exploited by uh, Russia. Uh, that it would make it harder to keep the United States uh, uh, fully committed to. Uh, defending NATO in the event of further Russian aggression. So I think uh, the Biden administration has a much more uh, uh, seasoned and uh, nuanced and uh, responsible uh, attitude. I think that uh, we will see uh, some of the differences that do exist between NATO states on nuclear weapons policy reemerge. Um, and to the argument that uh, that ban treaty states uh, are naive. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it, it's it's not a serious argument. Um, I think uh, uh, that kind of uh, criticism is is Trumpian in its uh, uh, in nature. Um, I think that um, uh, you know, the, if if NATO is serious about upholding uh, its stated commitment to nuclear disarmament and arms control. Uh, it needs to uh, be much more responsible. Uh, it needs to look forward to you know what can be done to reduce the growing risks uh, of uh, the growing tensions between NATO and Russia, what it can do to contribute to uh, the problems that currently exist with respect to uh, uh, non-strategic uh, and intermediate nuclear weapons with respect to the uh, possible demise of the new strategic arms reduction treaty. NATO has been very, especially um, the secretary general, very passive uh, and has not provided enough leadership. So I think, and I hope that NATO will um, adjust uh, in, in, in the, the coming year. Yeah, thank you. Actually, recently the NATO secretary general Stoltenberg uh, published a small article on the TPNW, and it sort of seems that he never read the NPT in terms of the R. Sorry. Alexander, would you like to say something on this issue of the democratic states versus autocratic states and the TPNW? Yes, yes uh, you read my mind. Uh, um, the TPNW sets a, a, a non-discriminatory norm against nuclear weapons, and, and it's clear that uh, different governments in different states will will face uh, different pressures. And naturally, the public discourse in an open society is by definition is more vibrant and sometimes very contested, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the issue of nuclear weapons. It is a function of 
democratic political systems. And it is to be expected, and in reality, it must be hoped for that democratic societies will have a more open discussion on nuclear weapons than autocratic uh, systems. Democratic uh, systems have also a more open and more contested uh, discourse about human rights and about climate change. Uh, uh, and nobody makes the argument because uh, uh, the issue of human rights is discussed uh, uh, more broadly uh, in in a democratic system that democracies should therefore uh, uh, not promote uh, this. So from which political system is the change in the nuclear weapons discussion supposed to come, if not from a democratic system or systems of states that engage in a broader, more inclusive and 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 uh, and and uh, uh, more profound decision-making process than autocratic states. So I think this is a this is I think is probably among the weakest arguments uh, that uh, that uh, that have been leveled against the TPNW. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite um, comments from our online participants. Please um, identify yourself and your affiliation. So. We have a question from Yasmin Sharif, and I will see if I can um, unmute you so that you can ask your question. Before, before, before that, just just bear with me one second. I have to go to another meeting, but I wanted to thank Daryl uh, and 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 Alex very much for for their support of this. Uh, endeavor, and of course Tarek for 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 you know being being an excellent moderator, and 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 I appreciate um, all our participants, of course, and everybody remaining in touch and stay safe. Thank you. And who are you? Uh, Can you tell us who you are? I'm Peter Rickwood. It says so right here. In case I've yes, lost but, my marbles. But what about you? Set up. Atomic reporters. That's what I. Oh meant. yeah, 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 yeah. But it was a kind okay. of group effort. Uh, Al Alex was 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 a little bit involved as well. So. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Right. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. We'll see if I can unmute Yasmin Sharif. Can you ask your question? I think she's still muted. Yep. There she is. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Um, thank you all very much for this very amazing talk. My name is Yasmin Sharif. I also work at Atomic Reporters together with Peter Rickwood and Tarek. Tarek, thank you very much for moderating this for us. And um, I have, I'm also a student at the Diplomatic Academy. I study environmental technology and international affairs. And my question to you would be, because this is a topic which I don't see circulating around in, in discussions much, and it would be what role and impact do recent advances in artificial intelligence and autonomous systems play on strate strategic stability and nuclear risk in the near future? And if, in your opinion, there should be any legal or ethical con concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Alexander or Daryl, who would like to respond to that? Well, I could say a few things. I mean, I think um, the developments uh, in AI as they relate to uh, nuclear command and control, um, uh, there, are, there are positive and very negative uh, possibilities. Um, I think uh, there needs to be, number one, a discussion between uh, the Russians, the Chinese, the Americans in particular about uh, uh, what they're trying to do with respect to um, uh, developing their uh, command and control systems and whether they are or are not trying to integrate artificial intelligence uh, into them in order to uh, be able to help them respond more quickly to a increasingly diverse and complicated array of uh, potential threats. Um, uh, in addition, they also need to be talking with one another about the downsides of cyber offensive capabilities, which is not AI, but uh, both uh, Russia and the United States and China have pretty significant cyber offensive capabilities, which uh, could potentially 
um, create confusion or could disrupt uh, nuclear command and control in a crisis and uh, severely complicate uh, the situation. And so in that respect, I think it's important that they not just discuss, but also agree to uh, refrain from or ban uh, cyber offensive attacks against one another's uh, command and control. Um, so even as we move towards a world without nuclear weapons, uh, which is a many years long process, um, we need to be looking at ways in which you know the the, the risks of nuclear war uh, can be reduced, and these new complexities created by disruptive technologies don't uh, make the situation worse. Mm -hmm. So I hope you will someday help us figure out the AI problem because, frankly, uh, there are no uh, experts on this issue yet. Uh, it is uh, uncharted territory. Can I just add to that? Sorry? Sure. Yes, please. I think there is there is agreement that uh, emergent technologies uh, um, and artificial intelligence uh, add more layers of risk. Um, and and uh, specifically also uh, uh, more uh, nuclear risks. Um, but of course, the conclusions then drawn from that uh, are different in a way. Uh, you 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 have uh, those more disarmament prone to use that expression, uh, see this as further reason um, that uh, uh, the risk of nuclear weapons use uh, is heightened and unintended consequences uh, are even more unpredictable. And the conclusions are therefore um, a stronger vindication, even, even stronger reason uh, to prohibit these weapons and to move away from nuclear deterrence. And I, at least I have the, I have the feeling or my observation is that if you look at the way the emerging technologies and artificial intelligence uh, dimension is discussed in in uh, nuclear armed states at least the way i observe is it's different uh, there is acknowledgement that it adds layers of risk but there is uh, the focus is primarily of, of sort of integrating emerging technologies into the strategic stability thinking so it's uh, rationalizing uh, emerging technologies within the concept of nuclear deterrence rather than looking at uh, uh, taking the step back, looking at it as a further reason to question the veracity of nuclear deterrence. Well, I don't know if if, uh, if I see a very skeptical expression on Daryl's face, so I'm not sure if he agrees uh, with that, but it's, it's uh, to me, a really interesting and important discussion. And I see, like you see everywhere in the nuclear debate that even there you see the divide, uh, then the conclusions that are being drawn from this new development. Uh, um, so it's a, it's a very important uh, space to watch and, and no matter where one stands on this issue, there's, there's certainly an added layer of risk which needs to be addressed, but the wider conclusions that are being drawn, I think you see exactly the deterrence disarmament divide also playing uh, the way the discussion on emerging technologies is framed. Yes, and I think there's also a concern that in some circles there is some thinking about automating a response to a potentially detected nuclear attack. I believe, Sylvia, you would like to ask a question. So if you do, unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's so good to hear the rich remarks from uh, Alex and Daryl and incisive questions from you, uh, Tarek. Uh, my name is Sylvia Mishra. I'm a doctoral researcher at King's College London, where I work on emerging technologies, its integration with nuclear weapons and how that uh, impacts the foundations of nuclear uh, deterrence in conflictual diets. And I also uh, work at uh, the European Leadership Network. So I have two questions. And if you indulge uh, me, my first question is uh, for Daryl. Uh, in your uh, remarks, uh, like you both succinctly captured some of the criticism of uh, the 
TPNW and uh, one of the things that uh, came up in the conversation was about how uh, it like the treaty should not create a parallel uh, with the NPT and uh, should not undermine the value and importance uh, that NPT brings. But I also feel that the TPNW creates a, a space for countries who have called uh, the NPT, a discriminatory uh, treaty, for example, India and Pakistan, they both have uh, leveled a uh, criticism that the, uh, the uh, NPT creates a, a, a club of nuclear haves and have-nots. So in that manner, the TPNW creates a more leveling kind of platform where uh, nuclear armed uh, countries like India, Pakistan, and for that matter, even uh, Israel can probably have a, or join discussions or be more active in terms of discussions about a more timeline based uh, nuclear disarmament. So I want to understand from Adil that how much or in what capacity do you see the TPNW opens up space for further and deeper engagements with uh, nuclear uh, armed countries who have been are more skeptical about the NPT. Uh, and my second question is for Alex. Um, are you, in your remarks, very uh, richly captured uh, how um, the TPNW really uh, discusses at length the, uh, the, some of the uh, discrepancies or like the um, holes that nuclear deterrence or the policy of nuclear deterrence is not viable as a bedrock of nuclear weapons policy making. And in that uh, capacity, it just seems that one of the arguments that are always uh, or always put forward by uh, professors in US universities or the fact that this uh, the deterrence theory is an intellectual undertaking um, it, it's a, it has its uh, it has its veracity in terms of the fact that in the last 75 years the world has not seen another major world war so in what capacity is the tpnw able to provide that intellectual kind of a grounding uh, in order to have a more focused discussion about uh, what is the security uh, like environment look like in the absence of nuclear weapons? Thank you. Well, those are two very good questions, uh, Sylvia. I mean, I think on the, the first one, uh, I mean, you raised an important point. Uh, the TPNW is, uh, applies universally to nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states. Uh, you know, in, in, in the, the context of the TPNW, uh, you know, India, Pakistan, Israel, outsiders to the NPT, uh, they're frankly as guilty as the United States, France, and Britain, and Russia, and China is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the TPNW. Um, so you know, I, in that sense, I think it it uh, it's 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 helpful uh, in 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 the sense that it creates a uh, a common playing field uh, that treats all states uh, in the same way. I don't think that the TPNW says anything specifically about a time-bound framework, which has been the long-held uh, position of the Indian government uh, about multilateral disarmament negotiations. I frankly think that the time-bound framework construct um, is uh, something of a, a holier-than-thou uh, policy designed to prevent uh, progress, since uh, you know India's diplomats uh, and experts know full well that uh, you know the pace of progress on disarmament uh, can't be you know artificially created in the negotiating room in Vienna or New York or wherever. So. Um, you know, I think that to come back to something I said, I mean, what is necessary now going forward uh, is that TPNW supporters, people like Alex, uh, who've been working hard in the TPNW, um, skeptics of the treaty, uh, countries and diplomats that are neutral towards the treaty, um, they need to uh, try to work together to have the difficult conversations about how to move forward uh, on the road to a world without nuclear weapons. I mean, the, the, the TPNW really is a framework, a legal framework for the endpoint. Uh, it uh, helps to reinforce the norms. It clarifies some of the legal issues. 
uh, but it does not outline you know how you navigate uh, the path towards the the end goal. So that still requires a lot of difficult work, creative thinking, uh, and some cooperation that has not been uh, has not existed for quite a long time. Uh, and so I think you know I, I hope that uh, that's one reason why I hope the new Biden administration will take a more neutral approach towards the TPNW so that it's in a better position, a more credible position to work together with the nuclear armed states and the non-nuclear armed states at the NPT and elsewhere to, to help um, you know, move forward in the, in the right direction. Very good Dennis? questions. Yeah, thank you. Very good questions. To just add to what Darren has just said, I just want to, to, to make the point um, that the actual process of elimination and the actual process of verification the elimination becomes conceptually significantly easier if it is based on a prohibition and if it's based on a broad uh, delegitimization of the weapon. It becomes conceptually almost impossible as long as you have the main protagonist said, well, in reality, we actually need this weapon. So how is nuclear disarmament, how is the elimination supposed to go forward if at the same time you make the argument that you actually need this weapon? And this is, I think, where the TPNW conceptually is an important step. Uh, so we often hear the critique that the TPNW doesn't do enough on verification. I think it just does enormous amount because it provides that it provides that conceptual uh, uh, pathway, actually. Um, if you look at uh, chemical weapons, of course, the situation was different with chemical weapons because you had basically everybody agreeing. But of course, it's the, you have the prohibition, you have the stigmatization. Chemical weapons are unacceptable. But then the verification becomes a technical process. And technical technical nuclear weapons verification is possible. We have the IEA, we have the expertise. That's not, it's the political dimension that makes it so complicated. Because as long as you want or think you need to maintain nuclear deterrence and parity, the lower you get, the more complicated it becomes. I think that's an important point that I wanted to make. On your second question, um, we don't know. We don't know whether nuclear weapons kept the peace. Yeah? There has been no nuclear war, which that's a fact. But we cannot, from that fact, derive one-to-one -one, that's because we had nuclear weapons. And I think that's, the, that's part of the problem. We don't know. We, it may have been the case. It may not have been the case. What we know is that we've been, uh, on several occasions, bloody lucky. Yeah, uh, there were mistakes. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis is the most uh, talked about aspect. So, uh, yes, there was no nuclear war, but I think that in itself is not, uh, is not proof for nuclear deterrence to work. And even if you could make the argument on this and this and this occasion, it was nuclear weapons that kept the peace. You just don't know for the next opportunity. And I think that's the sustainability point that Daryl made before. Um, uh, it's a great concept. Of course, it's a great concept. Uh, you have a weapon and it's so terrible that there will never be any war. But it's possibly, at least, only a fallacy. And uh, the problem with nuclear weapons is that we just cannot afford the trial and error approach. It just simply is, is just too devastating and too risky. And I think that that is the... Uh, do the, do the TPNW supporters have the answer to all the security dilemmas that are out there? No. But I think the, the argument that the nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence answer that we've been given for the past 70 years is not a sustainable answer for the next 70 years, as Daryl said. That's a very cogent uh, set of arguments. And uh, if you look at the different factors, the different drivers, the knowledge about the consequences and the amplification of risks, uh, it makes the argument even stronger. So um, that would be my answer to the scholars in uh, US uh, universities. Uh, it's, it's, uh, 
uh, it's ultimately unprovable. It's weighing. I cannot prove that nuclear deterrence doesn't work, but proponents of nuclear deterrence cannot prove that it has worked. So what you have to do is you have to weigh, and you have to weigh the what is known about the consequences and risks against the assumed security benefit. And that's a very difficult issue, but it's a discussion, it's, it's too much of, of a dogmatic theological discussion uh, that the value and benefit of nuclear deterrence is positive. It needs to be challenged, it's too risky. And I think the, 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 the TPNW supporters, that's basically the discussion that uh, the TPNW uh, poses, asks for, demands. Alex, if I could, one quick point. I, I agree with your main, the main thrust of what, what you just said. I would just uh, note that while there hasn't been nuclear war, nuclear weapons have been used uh, about 2,000 plus times over the last 75 years with nuclear testing, nuclear weapons production. Sure. One important part of the treaty, which we haven't mentioned yet, I just wanted to flag is there are the so-called positive obligations in Articles 6 and 7 obligating yes. states, parties to provide victim assistance and environmental remediation for those affected by nuclear weapon use and testing. So uh, that's important to, to note, uh, especially uh, I think in, in response to those people who say that nuclear weapons have kept the peace. If you've lived down when from nuclear testing or a nuclear bomb plant as I once did, uh, you might have a different point of view. Yeah, actually, actually that's a very good point, Daryl. Also just, just to add that while a central, a central war might have been avoided in Europe, it's the peoples of the developing world in Indochina and Africa and Latin America and the Middle East during the 70 years that have paid the price through proxy wars. Anyway, we now have just time for one quick question each to Daryl and to Alexander, and then we will uh, wrap up. Um, so, Daryl, um, what activities have you and other NGOs planned in the U.S. with regard to the TPNW? Um, I mentioned your meeting coming up tomorrow. Maybe you could say a little bit more and how people can uh, log into that one. Well, uh, it, it uh, may not come as a shock to those of you outside the United States, but uh, here uh, in the U.S., uh, January 20th is the date that most people are paying attention to the inauguration of the new president. Um, not the 22nd, but there is a, a good deal of uh, interest in the uh, the non-governmental community about the entry into force date. Uh, are there going to be activities planned over the next uh, several weeks to, to highlight the significance of the entry into force? Uh, we, in particular, at the Arms Control Association, have been working for several weeks to engage with the Biden transition team on a variety of, of issues uh, they, they, they're facing, uh, not just the... I mean, they're, they're, they face the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, economic problems, uh, restoring democracy, uh, but they also have a number of, of nuclear-related decisions to make. So uh, among them is, you know, how to respond uh, to and, and how to treat the TPNW, how to prepare for the NPT review conference. So we've been encouraging uh, a much more uh, serious and conciliatory approach that, uh, that builds bridges, that builds progress. Um, and so a lot of that has been private um, conversations. We will be hold, hosting a briefing tomorrow on a new report that we've released on first 100 days nuclear challenges. That's at 11 Eastern time. Information is on the Arms Control Association website. Thank you, Daryl. Um, finally to you, Alexander. So under the treaty, um, the first conference of states parties is supposed to take place uh, within one year after entry into force. Now, I think given the way the coronavirus is working, probably it may not be possible to do this meeting by January of next year, and perhaps it might be kicked over a little bit later into the summer of 2022. Um, I would say that Vienna would be a perfect uh, location to hold the first conference of states parties, given uh, the leadership role that Austria has played. And I'll toot my own horn a little bit, and I think you know what's coming. I've been arguing that the NPT review conference also should be moved to Vienna, and I don't think we will likely have this conference in August this year, and to move it also to next year around April, May, and combine it with the PREPCOM. 
Um, so um, perhaps you might be reluctant to say something about moving the review conference to Vienna, but at, at least on the first conference of states parties, perhaps you might say something uh, about Aust the possibility of Austria holding it uh, and uh, what might be expected to be discussed at this first conference of states parties of the nuclear ban treaty. Well, thank you. On the review conference, we'll, we'll hear by the April, I understand, uh, whether or not it will be possible to hold it in, uh, in, in August. Uh, um, the first meeting of states parties, uh, uh, there are currently uh, no decisions have been taken to not have it within the uh, one year time frame. It's foreseen by the treaty. Uh, I think uh, uh, the Secretary the general uh, office, uh, who's the depository of the treaty, is looking for um, is looking for conference facilities. Austria has offered to host uh, the meeting at the UN facility in uh, in uh, in uh, Vienna, uh, and uh, and uh, um, so what is to be discussed? There are a number of um, there are a number of things on the menu, items on the menu as per the treaty. Uh, there's first of all, there are declarations to be submitted. Uh, there are some decisions regarding timelines in Article, fear, uh, Article 4 to be to be made. There are some initial discussions at least on, on uh, uh, the competent uh, international authority. Um, there is, uh, um, uh, Daryl mentioned, the very important positive obligations on uh, victim assistance and on environmental uh, remediation. Uh, this is going to be, this will have to be concretized uh, at this meeting. And then Article 12, of course, uh, um, contains the obligation for states parties to work towards the universalization of the treaty. So this is something, uh, this is something that's got to be fleshed out at this meeting. Uh, how exactly is this going to be done? Uh, uh, um, but beyond that, beyond the sort of menu of issues um, uh, foreseen by the treaty, I think politically it's uh, uh, extremely important to uh, to demonstrate that this is a serious treaty by serious countries that have taken this international obligation after a serious security assessment and and consideration of international law and uh, uh, and uh, national interest uh, so there is a uh, it's important that uh, the conference itself is run smoothly and seriously that it is a constructive uh, meeting uh, so we certainly hope and it's a uh, uh, the secretary general is the depository so every state will receive an invitation so we certainly hope from the Austrian side is that uh, um, there will be as many states as possible, even those who at the moment uh, uh, don't consider joining the treaty. And lastly, it is of course also an opportunity to, uh, to re-emphasize uh, the substantive arguments of, of the TPNW, to uh, return, to re-emphasize to the to um, what is out there in terms of new research regarding the consequences of nuclear weapons? What is out there in terms of more understanding of risks related to nuclear weapons? So I certainly hope that the meeting will also provide a, a forum to uh, raise these issues again and return to those issues to, to, uh, to, to be one of hopefully many uh, avenues where the uh, rationale behind the TPNW is promulgated and and uh, and put forward. So thank you. So very very briefly. Um, so this first conference will probably need to have a preparatory session. So you agree on the rules of procedure, participation, who presides over this, the location, and so on. I doubt we can go directly into a conference of states parties without a preparatory session. Very briefly. Well, of course, it's uh, for every international treaty. Uh, the situation is very difficult at the moment, uh, and 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 uh, this is not uh, for Austria to decide. This is this is uh, uh, there are informal ways among uh, uh, states parties to get a sense of how to move forward in the circumstances that we have. Uh, so uh, uh, there is a a certain need. For 
for formality to prepare the meeting that's absolutely uh, clear but there's also there are also informal ways uh, we just had a, a, a discussion organized by unidea earlier this afternoon starting to drill into the implementation issue these kind of uh, more informal aspects will also be important it's a it's a new treaty there are lots of open questions that need to be dealt with uh, so a combination between formal and informal uh, uh, avenues to prepare states parties as best as can possibly be done in these difficult circumstances to be able. It's certainly not possible to go to this meeting without preparation. So it's, uh, uh, and, and given the difficult circumstances, uh, the best way has to be found. But uh, this is a collective undertaking of, of, of the Secretariat together with uh, with uh, uh, with the states parties. Well, we've come to the end of a very rich uh, discussion. So I would like to thank uh, both Alexander and Daryl for taking the time to join us today, as well as our online participants uh, for their questions and to our Atomic uh, Reporters colleague, uh, Florian, for arranging the meeting and doing the technical part. So I wish uh, everyone to remain safe and to have a happy and productive uh, 2021. Um, Alex, uh, Alexander and Daryl, if you just stay on the line for another minute for technical reasons. To everyone else, uh, goodbye and thanks for logging in.